I'm speaking here on behalf of translation studies as an academic discipline that is no longer in its infancy. We've been growing very steadily uh, since at least the mid 1980s. And we continue to grow even in the age of machine translation, which is neural and it's getting very good. Even the age of global language learning of English, still translation grows and that's intriguing in itself. We know quite a lot about how translations are produced. We're starting to know a fair bit about the history of translation. We're doing a lot of work on the interface with technology and in the training institutions. What we really don't know about, or not enough about, I'm going to argue, is the way that translations are received. That means if it's a written text, a written translation, how are they read? Uh, but the question applies to interpreting as well. And here I'm looking at that, not just because it's a gap in our knowledge, but because a lot of assumptions are made about the reader or the receiver. And it's quite amazing to me that those assumptions are not tested. Uh, towards the end of the talk, you'll also see why this is of great interest to me. I think we're in an age now of pandemics and of climate emergencies where uh, our communication across languages and across cultures not only has to defend minor languages, and that's a very important part of what we do, but has to change behavior, has to inform and change behavior. Uh, and there, we really want to know not just how do we get our work received, but how can we communicate across languages, across cultures to change things in the world? So I'm, uh, I'm looking um, for a rather, uh, it's a tall order, if you will. Uh, you can see there the kinds of assumptions that are made. Now, I'm, I'm, uh, I could pick on almost any literary scholar or literary translation theorist, or literary translator for that matter. Uh, here I'm picking on, on Venuti for no apparent reason. Well, yes, for some apparent reason, he will be speaking, I believe, in this prestigious series of talks. So I'm, I'm getting you ready, okay? Uh, these are just examples. It's not, okay, it's fun to go to Venuti. It's easy to pick on him and, and I amuse myself. But look, yeah, a popular reader may regard. Now, who is this popular reader? We don't know. Uh, readers play a role. Thank you. Very good. The general tendency to read translations mainly for reading. Well, what, what an enormous assumption about the way people actually read. Uh, not only do we know who the popular reader is, but we know exactly what the general tendency is without any empirical knowledge. And yet, in this construct, I'm sure you're aware of it, of the way a certain kind of translating will bring about a certain awareness of, of foreignness and will bring about change in the world. What we are tackling in that particular work is no less than uh, an image of Anglo-American culture that is, I think he says, arguably, no, without too much exaggeration, imperialistic abroad and xenophobic at home. Uh, the argument in Venuti in that classic book is that a certain way of translating will help change that enormous cultural attitude. It's a tall order. And I think it deserves to be based on more than assumptions about what the Reading Act is. The same thing in a slightly later uh, classic Venuti, uh, the domestic reader. We know about its, her, his approach. How do we know? the reader comes to realize, I mean, and so on, and so on. It's, it's common because these people have been trained in, in literary studies and comparative literature. They are expert readers of texts and Venuti is an excellent translator and excellent producer of texts. But in those disciplines, we have long had the image of the implied reader, that the reading position is in the text and that by 
knowing how to read in an expert way, we don't really have to look at any other reader, do we? Uh, because they're doing what they should be doing. Uh, Venuti in this particular book uh, goes even further. Uh, if you've read it, you'll, you'll know that he takes to task uh, the reviewers of his translations. Uh, why? Because they are not reading the translation in the way he has instructed them to do so in the preface. Okay, so there's this expert reading position from the super translator who not only knows what readers do, but can tell certain readers that they should be doing what they are ordered to do. This is a uh, wondrous strange. What, what a peculiar construct that we're there to tell the rest of the world how to read what we produce. He's not the first, of course, classic Ezra Pound in the long line. No, 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 no. I won't go into Ezra Pound's politics, but he was on the wrong side of the divide, as people would know. Uh, expert readers can oppose the rest and teach them how to do it. And if you're not doing it right, you're wrong. Now, I'm wondering if that's good enough. Uh, what do we really know about the rest, the people who are not expert readers, and how can we find out? This is a classic uh, citation made in studies of reading. Uh, Montaigne, 16th century, uh, speech belongs half to the person who speaks and half to the person who listens. I love that. It's always there. Uh, half to the speaker, half to the listener. The listener plays a role in it. I've often wondered why is it half? Half seems rather excessive, doesn't it? You know, to give half of the text to the reader. Uh, but if you read the actual citation in context, uh, uh, the person here, that is the, the receiver in, in my terminology, has to get ready to play according to the spin with which it comes. And what is coming? Well, the metaphor is people playing uh, jeu de paume, uh, proto-tennis. It's a tennis match, ladies and gentlemen, with obviously one half of the court to the person who's speaking and the other half of the court to the person who's receiving. And the person receiving has to play the ball in accordance with the spin put on it by the person sending it. So we're doing a translation and you'll know this if you're a translator. You can say everything in a slightly different way. There are, there are a thousand variations that we work with. We can put the spin on it and force the way that the ball has to be received. Montaigne, though, is talking about experience and he's talking about learning and changing people through the art of conversation. He's not just there producing text to see that they're read correctly. He's seeing the ball being sent back and the game goes on uh, to the mutual pleasure of the players. So much from Montaigne. It's an interesting citation and, um, and important in that it, it, it places what we do in the context of a wider to and fro. Uh, too much of our studies on translation, especially literary translation, is author translator and getting those two aligned. We forget that down the road, there's a receiver who can send back messages to the start culture over here, who can send back more messages and that on this global level, not just in the jeu de pomme, in the proto tennis, on this global level, we are engaged in conversations in twos and fros and not just in aligning one text with another. Reception is not new in literary studies and in aesthetics in general. I won't go through them in detail, but in Gadam, in the phenomenology of reception, Gadamer for certain in, in hermeneutics, uh, Yaus in literary studies and literary history, uh, Issa uh, bringing that across into the phenomenology of reading. And we have alive and well, mostly in Germany, but not exclusively, a hermeneutic approach to translation, 
remaining faithful to that tradition, more particularly to Gadamer. Uh, however, their focus is on the translator as a receiver, as a reader, as an interpreter. Whereas my interest here is not in the translator as such, it's in the receiver of the translation. So that school exists. Um, they have their arguments with Skopos people. For me, that's not really relevant. I am moving further downstream. I want to see what happens for the readers. Same thing here. If we look at the act of reading, there's a, a fair body of knowledge on the way translators read as expert readers, as opposed to any other reader, I guess, with eye tracking studies of this kind, where you see that reading for translation is far heavier and far more complex than normal reading. But uh, those conclusions are once again, uh, focused on the translator and don't really tell us about this person up here, the non-expert reader, if you will, the non-translator. Audiovisual translation has been the leader in this field. And we know a lot about many variables in the reception of, of particularly subtitles in audiovisual material uh, of various kinds. Uh, and this is uh, important research, it's growing research. It uses research technologies, which are the same uh, as those used on translators. That's why I showed you the previous screen. Uh, we are looking at uh, eye tracking, particularly keystroke logging and, uh, no, not keystroke for reading, of course, sorry, and, uh, and neuroimaging. So we're getting, uh, and you know, you can measure dilation of the pupils and measure stress levels and things. And we can find out more or less what's going on in the mind of the receiver. Uh, and the tendency is to get more and more uh, uh, use of technologies that can penetrate closer and closer to the mind with one or two different technologies uh, using triangulation. Now, I, I did write in the, uh, in the abstract that reception studies or what we know about the reception of translations is disappointing. And some people were worried about that. Oh, oh, is he talking about me? Is my, is my work disappointing? Is all of this uh, disappointing? No, no, no. My disappointment is rather different. Um, I'm disappointed that this kind of study can get closer and closer to the receiving mind, but is not telling me about the wider effects that translation might have. It's not telling me about how to combat that xenophobia and imperialism that Venuti was talking about. It's, it's not telling me what translations can do in the world. And it's not telling me what kind of translation will lead to what kind of social effect. Uh, this, this, this obsession of penetrating towards the individual mind uh, can lead to research that will help technologies, which will help accessibility, which will tell us things about different audiences and the way they use subtitles. It can show that subtitles help in language learning, although the case is often overstated, I suspect. Um, all of that is very useful, but it's not really getting to the level of argument that, it, that I want, which is more on the social effect level. Uh, for sure, this research is great and, and very necessary uh, when it contests uh, commonly held opinions, okay? Uh, that if people don't believe that uh, subtitles teach people a language, then go and do the research. Or we had somebody uh, come out and say, uh, you shouldn't do research on fan subbing because it's unethical with regard to professional translators. Well, I'll go and do it. I'll go and do that research. Now I'm going to have to go very quickly. Uh, I just realized. The few studies that do set out to test the effects of different ways of translating are genuinely disappointing. The first one was this by Jelle Stegemann in German, and 
he only found significant differences. He compares different translations of, of a late 19th century uh, Dutch novel in German, and he, he's looking at reader response, and he finds only minor aspects are different. A, a bigger study, this is um, in Chinese, um, looking at uh, two different versions of Gone with the Wind into Chinese, one classified as domesticating, the other as foreignizing, comes to the disappointing conclusion, no significant differences. And we also find there in that first study that the foreign meant different things to different people, that um, the, the notion that there were two ways of translating was not going to give two different reactions on behalf, on behalf of the public. Uh, a wider uh, study then uh, found again that the two translations were statistically more indistinguishable than distinguishable. Even though the academics up there had said those translations are different, one is domesticating, one is foreignizing, the readers, when they were giving their, their uh, their, their feedback could not indicate that difference. Uh, in this sense, uh, the research is disappointing. And if I look at the actual questions that the readers there were being asked, I'm not surprised. The ones in red are the ones where there was some slight significant difference, but all those 10 questions, I'm sorry, they are looking at what could be 10 different variables or 10 different ways of reacting to the text. Uh, the problem, I think, here was the assumption that there were just two ways of translating and that that would correspond to two ways of reception. What we find is that there are many, many more things happening in reception if you bother to ask the receivers. Now, a few years ago, I was um, worried about this. I could see that the reception studies were not going anywhere on the basis of uh, different translations and doing empirical work on that basis. And so I started to do something quite different. I wanted to know how people change their worldviews. And so I went looking for people who in their life had changed their view of the world. And I did interviews with people. I'm trained as a sociologist but I spent too long looking at texts and I started to look at some lives. And I uh, had uh, access to uh, three people who had come out of Syria and I interviewed them. They'd grown up under Assad and they changed their worldview entirely. And I did the same for people in uh, apartheid in South Africa. And what did I find in those? I, I, I was looking for the role of languages, the role of literature, what is it that made you change your worldview? Uh, do people with many languages, for example, have many different cultural spaces and this can promote deep questions within them? Well, what I found was what, what missionaries have always known, what evangelists have always known. Uh, all of them, all of them had changed because of one-on-one -on -one conversations with a special person or group of people with whom they had established a relation of trust, which became more important than the other relations, which thereby had less trust leading to distrust. One-on-one -on -one conversations, not reading a book, not somebody giving a lecture, talking with somebody, getting involved in communication, had brought about change. This worried me. It worried me because I'd been looking at the wrong things or I'd been looking at texts in the wrong way, I think. Behavior change conversations, which is what really interests me, are with people who are trusted. And the first thing a text would have to do is to enter there in such a way that it can be trusted and function in such a way that it sparks off something like a conversation. You can do research on translations as conversations. And this is where I'm getting to the disappointment part. 
I want to make the case that a lot of the work that's being done on these methodologies, uh, spying on the brain, are, is not strictly necessary. I get rid of it like that. And we can do other things like go back to alternative uh, research methods, such as interviews, focus groups, and questions that have no right answer. And what I want to do now for the next 20 minutes or so is uh, show the work that we are doing uh, with myself and some doctoral students. I'm at a stage of life where I live through my doctoral students. I, I'm sorry about that. Uh, their names are all there. There are many more. I've just selected a few to give you an idea of the kinds of research that can be done uh, without this, this spying on the brain type of methodology and the kinds of questions uh, that we are asking. Okay, I'll go really, really quickly. Um, some of them are, are rather easy. Uh, this, this is one that we're doing this year. It's about Australian brand names. And we figured, well, what kind of translation of a brand name works in China? Ah, interesting question, especially because the Chinese buy powdered milk from Australia because they trust it for their babies. And what do you find? What advertising is always known? They trust the brand they've known for longest. So they're all different kinds of translation strategies. And, and all we discovered there was that it doesn't matter how you translate it. People have to know the brand and interact with it and build up the brand. And that's what creates trust. Uh, well, it's a valuable lesson to know that we can learn from, from, from marketing. This is one from way back. Yunji uh, works for Apple in California and she produces uh, this kind of website for Apple and checks it. And she uh, was seeing how professional readers, heavy readers, translators and editors, compare with light readers. So she got, I think she got her gardeners, she got chefs, she got some engineers to go over the website and see if they could spot things like this. Things like there's a gap there and there's not a gap there, but there are other mistranslations fed into the website. And she found, uh, surprisingly, that the heavy readers, the professionals were quite tolerant of translation errors the reason is not mysterious. They knew enough English to fall back on that and make sense of the Korean. But that in the non-professional readers, uh, mistakes led to frustration very quickly. And that frustration very quickly led to a lack of trust in the brand. Uh, so uh, her work is to produce excellent web pages uh, for Apple. Uh, she works on the details. Uh, she was uh, disappointed in the degree of tolerance. But here, uh, with regard to the quality of the language and the, the butterfly effect of, of, of apparently small translations leading to frustration and then loss of trust, uh, meant that the way certain readers read uh, a text justifies great care in that particular case. I'm moving on to another one that we just did this year, which is good fun as well. Uh, Bian Cheng is a, a Chinese novel about a border town. It's a classic novel from early on in the 20th century. And uh, we gave the, uh, the subjects four different translations of the novel uh, in short passages. And then we asked them to draw where the town was. So they had to select which of these maps shows where the town is and the translations are slightly different in their descriptions. Is there a right answer? No, of course it's not a right answer. It's not a comprehension test. And we get their answers and we see that they, they're going with that description, some of them, and then that one as well, all right? And they're rather similar. So they, and then we map those answers back onto the translations and we infer which translations they are trusting when they give the answer. They don't see the ST, the star text is out of the picture. They're just reading four versions of the same absent original, which is the way people in other cultures tend to read. This is another example close up. 
we are uh, showing you the moonlight and the bamboos. It's a Chinese novel. They've all got moonlight and bamboos. And the moonlight is turning the bamboo black. And you have to read this and figure out, well, well, what the hell? How does light turn bamboo black? What is the logic of it there? Uh, you, I hope the eye can read faster than I can speak, so you might have decided. We get, then get these four reasons, and they choose the one that they think is the most logical. And then we map that back onto the translations. And what we find in this study, see, it's not a comprehension test. It's a, it's a trust test. Which, which translation are you relying on in order to answer these quite difficult questions where, which have no correct answer? Uh, it was found that the order, the historical order of translations went in degrees of increasing trust. The, the readers trusted the translations closest to them in time and then successively further back. So it was really a study of retranslation. It's a new form of retranslation hypothesis. Uh, why are new translations done? In order to gain increasing trust. This is a doctoral thesis, which Bay finished this year. Uh, she's looking at Chinese um, foreign affairs discourse, and she's got uh, a whole lot of different readers here, ranging from professional readers to Australian students who don't know much about China. And the texts range from the bureaucratic to a text about the, the premier of China attending an Australian football match and wearing two scarves. So, so they were, it wasn't all serious. Um, it was about uh, building up trust in the other uh, through different kinds of texts. The banal finding, if you like, is that the more knowledge of Chinese, that is the closer you go up this list here, the greater the preference for low intervention that is literalism stayed close to the text, which means that the people down here uh, did appreciate uh, more changes and more intervention. However, not always. There were many other things going on. For example, we had quite poetic texts from this exotic ancient China thing. Uh, one example is Pictures and Plums. I gave a lecture on that, which you can find on YouTube if you like. And this sort of exoticism in the texts was found to be appealing uh, to the readers who, who otherwise knew very little about China and, and didn't really know what these texts meant. But this was a way of them getting into the culture and exploring the rest of the meanings that were around them. It seemed quite successful. So often the, 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 uh, the fragments of text that are not known and are not interpreted in any sure way happen to be some of the most appealing. And then it was found that high intervention texts, lots of domestication, sort of explaining things. Uh, so it's very, very close in the terms uh, that belong to the receiving culture here. Uh, one would think that would gain more trust uh, for the non-expert readers, but no, quite the opposite. Uh, the readers found this suspicious. They found, for example, if a text is telling them that, that China is committed to free trade, and they say, well, wait a minute, no, this doesn't, so this sounds too good to be true. This sounds too much like you are telling me what I want to hear. Uh, we found a reaction against that. So this defeated the hypothesis that uh, domestication creates trust. Uh, trust, as you can see, is written in the sands and the waves come across and it can disappear quite quickly. Uh, Bay is now working on the logic of trade-offs here and uh, what we find in the reader's discourse, this is a research done on individual interviews and then focus groups uh, talking about the translations. We give them three different translations. They express their preferences and their reading, uh, their, their reasons for, for liking one translation rather than another. And we find things like this. Um, if there's a lot of unfamiliar idioms, I'll stop. Too much uh, information overload, stop. I can't do it. But if there's one, hey, let's Google it because it's interesting. 
the reader there is going to get involved in it. So imagine you're on that uh, tennis court that Montaigne had, you know, you send me 10 tennis balls fast, I'll just get off the court and go running. Uh, but send me an interesting one, you know, I'll try to play it and I'll, I'll, I'll take the spin or I'll go back and check and I'll get involved in the text. Uh, so there's a trade-off here, you see. It's not a case of two variables, like domesticating foreignizing or literal or free. You've got two axes, one of familiarity, okay, and one of information overload. And another example there, you might have uh, beauty and then comprehension. Uh, I will under I'll put up with, with not being sure about my comprehension of the text as long as the poetry has a certain aesthetic appeal. And there's a trade-off between these values, a balancing act. And then you find in the receptions, you get to points which are tipping points where one of those values becomes too heavy. It, it outweighs the other. Trust is lost. The reading process stops or people prefer a radically different translation. Good, we've got a f nine minutes left. I'll be on to doctoral work in progress. Jurong's work is on subs, fan subs for Chinese drama. And this is fascinating for me because I'm not into this world at all. So I'm learning as one does from my doctoral students. As you can see there, the, uh, the translators, the fan subbers, uh, put in translator's notes on the screen to help with comprehension of the cultural difference. And that's an intriguing practice in itself. But this goes on because you get all these time comments coming in uh, as people are watching the drama online. And so you're getting discussions of the, uh, the uh, meaning of the... Uh, Subtitles, and here you've got you know somebody making a comment on the relationship between the characters, and somebody else comes back and says, "No, let's clear this up. It's not like that. It's like that," and and you get a conversation online around the products that people are seeing and the way it's being subtitled, and that conversation gets carried over into online uh, exchanges with the subtitles, which we can have uh, translated there as Jurong has done that for us. You see what I mean by that thing from Montaigne, that conversation and the spin coming in and the people playing it back. This is what's happening online in these subtitles. Uh, the, the, the consumer is proactive, we know, they're helping to form the product, we know that as well, but we have involvement in, um, in the creation of meaning. Is it trust? What's intriguing here is that many of the people engaged in this conversation uh, at least have Chinese names. Uh, the subtitles are in English. Ostensibly, they are for people outside of the culture, but uh, the Chinese people are coming in and, and very happy to give advice, to give knowledge, to share opinions about this. The subtitles are also for them. It is a place of intercultural conversation. Uh, Sakai noticed something very similar for um, translations of Japanese into English. Okay. This research is ongoing. Jurong uh, is just in her first year of her doctorate. And uh, we, we've got an interesting problem because of COVID. And I'm sort of finishing with this, I guess. Uh, we were going to do eye tracking, but we can't bring the subjects to where the eye tracker is. And so we're thinking of alternatives. Now, one of the things people do when they watch these dramas is go backwards and forwards. You know, if you've missed something, you go back. And if it's boring, you go forwards. And people are talking with each other, talking or writing with each other about it as they go. So what we did... We are thinking now of not doing eye tracking, of not going high tech, of not getting into the brain of the receiver, but just letting them do whatever they want on the screen, go backwards and go forwards, using Zoom as our research tool. So the, uh, the researcher is there and the viewer is there and enabling a free conversation 
We're going back in time to the kinds of think aloud protocols done in the 1990s. Why? Because that conversation is the act of reception. That conversation is how we find out how that information might actually enter the life of the receiver. Now, why am I interested in that? Because we're in an age of a pandemic, we're in an age of a climate emergency, and we're in an age where communication across languages and cultures has to bring about change. In Australia, we've got news around us of bad translations. But if you look at it, it's not bad translations, it's just people going fast and mixing up languages. Here's one, mixing Farsi with Arabic. Uh, and this one over here mixes Indonesian with Turkish because whoever put it together didn't know that they were different languages. Are the translators doing a reasonable job? Probably. But the people who are producing the translations have forgotten the basic message. Test it with a real reader. That's the bottom line. Test it with a real reader and see what the effect is. Then you can go about fixing it up and making sure it gets the kind of effect you want. This is an email sent to a family uh, a little north of where I am now in Melbourne. And in that family, the email says that your family can now end isolation. It's finished. You, you, you've got over COVID, you can go out and the son went back to school. However, the son had not been tested for COVID. And so technically he was not in isolation. He was in quarantine. Uh, the family read this, sent the son to school and it set off um, a chain of infections that went for, for, for quite a way. Uh, what was the cause of this? The cause was not the uh, Arabic speaking family's English, their English is excellent. The cause was not uh, that they misunderstood this message uh, particularly. The cause was somehow that they didn't know that isolation means one thing and quarantine means another. Uh, the cause was the people who wrote this message uh, were not testing what effect it would have, uh, was not written for the particular situation of this family. There's a long story behind the difference between isolation and quarantine. I hope your culture can handle it better than the Australian culture. What we're finding and what we found, we went through 112 days of lockdown and we have no COVID here. Zero in this state. We're at day six, no, oh, geez, at day 18. Zero. How do they do that? They didn't send out silly messages like that or get them translated one by one and get them checked, although that's what you can do. They sent around people to have conversations with people in languages, getting the information, making it real, gaining the trust of the people, and then making the people understand why they should change their behavior. That is stay inside, wear a mask and everything else we know we should be doing. Uh, what do we know about how people receive translations? Very little. We know that it's complex. We know that it's more complex than what we thought of what literary theorists would think. We know that it's far more complex than one way of translating having any effect or another having an effect. But what I'm increasingly finding is that what we need is not just translations. We need that kind of conversation situation on the person to person level or on the wider historical level of culture to culture. We need a conversation in order to change behavior and not just the reception of isolated translations.